I'm a great admirer of John Muir. I've read most of his writings and uh, I've thought about his travels for my whole childhood. And uh, I've tried to explore the world in much the same spirit as he did. I happen to be able to have a lot of tools at my disposal that he lacked. And so one of the things that I've been able to do is to climb into these trees to understand what's going on. And that has given me insights that, that Muir himself was never able to get because he was mostly bound to the ground. I know that John Muir climbed trees without ropes. He didn't have access to the rope systems that we have today. And when I first got started in uh, climbing trees out here in the West, uh, I did do a couple foolish ascents without any backup equipment and just kind of John Muir style jumping from branch to branch. Uh, I wouldn't recommend it. I'm lucky to have survived just as he is. I've never fallen out of a tree. It's because I've been tied into it with ropes. So uh, that's a huge advantage. I've had a couple situations where a line that I'd shot into a tree over what I thought was a sturdy branch turned out not to be over such a sturdy branch and the rope had slipped. And so you're climbing up the rope through space and you find yourself falling and then you hit and that was very difficult. I'm excited about the big trees because there's so few of them left in part. But even if you think of the larger perspective, how many species of trees are there in this world that have individuals that are at least 300 feet tall? The answer is five. The two California redwoods, Douglas fir and Sitka spruce, and the Australian mountain ash, Eucalyptus regnans. That's it. So why are there only five? And my quest is to try to understand what are the factors that ultimately control how tall trees can get in any given forest. And at this point, we're standing amidst the tallest forest. It's dominated by one species, and uh, they do extremely well in this very low diversity environment. So it's not so much for me about the diversity, it's about the phenomenon. What are the factors that ultimately control how tall a tree can grow to be? Trees don't grow from the inside out. They grow from the out out. They lay down a ring of wood across the whole surface of their body. And what we're learning is that as these trees get bigger and older, the rate of wood production at the whole tree level, like how much wood does this tree make, increases. And it increases through old age. So that in this forest right now, which is the world's tallest forest, the trees in this forest that are putting on the most wood are the biggest and oldest trees. The, uh, the giant sequoias are probably the most amazing tree in the world. And the reason is because they're so huge for their environment. There are limbs in these trees that are 10 feet diameter. We were there in the snow this winter uh, for um, a photography shoot to capture what it's like in the giant sequoia canopy when there's all the snow. And we had feet and feet of snow fell this winter. And so there were, there were limbs that were 10 feet thick with three feet of snow on them. Just amazing. We've seen fire caves in the giant sequoias, um, big ones that you could repel into huge openings in these trees. Lots and lots of charcoal up there. Um, there's epiphytic trees on giant sequoia. We found epiphytic sugar pines growing on limbs. We had a 22 year old sugar pine growing on a limb and it had a ribes understory, the current bush, growing on a big old limb. Um, we've even found um, white fir growing on giant sequoia, oaks, two species of oaks. There's the hazels that grow on them. Um, I've even found giant sequoias growing on giant sequoias as epiphytes. So those trees, I mean, because they get so big and they live so long, a lot of cool stuff happens up there. That guy, if you read John Muir's writing about trees, what, what's amazing to me about his understanding of trees is that, and this is late 19th century, he understood how giant sequoias worked. He, and, and Coast Redwoods, he had limited, more limited experience, but he was here. And he could tell what was going on. And some of his insights about giant sequoia to this day are as keen as ever. I mean, the guy was super observant and he lacked the extensive data that we have now from all the people who've been collecting information about this, these trees since he passed. But his insights were right up there. I mean, I still read his, his writings about trees and realize, wow, he truly understood how these trees work.